Hi, Peter. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sabine. Thanks for having me on the show. It's really great to have you. I know it's early morning for you, late evening for, for me. So this might make for interesting <laughs> dynamics, which is a good thing. It might. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your journey, uh, your life journey. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And how did you go about uh, becoming Peter Cork? So I was born in Melbourne uh, a very long time ago. Uh, I moved, uh, my parents moved to the country. So I went, went to a country high school, had fantastic teachers. I uh, really interested in science. Uh, and back then it was all about electronics and it was about radios. Computers really were just these huge big machines that, you know, you couldn't afford. A school couldn't have one. A person couldn't have one. Uh, so yeah, it was all about radios. I decided I want to do electrical engineering. So I went to university and studied that. And that's when I guess I got really interested in computers and coding. And robotics didn't happen to me for a little while later. Uh, it was my first job. Uh, I stayed on at the university as an RA and uh, put together a, a robot demo for a op uh, university open day. And so that was my first experience with robots. So a uh, little tiny robot with stepper motors and I programmed it to play checkers or drafts as we would call it in Australia. And it was a bit of a hit. And then just a few months later, there was an advertisement in the newspaper for the Australia's national uh, R&D agency uh, called CSIRO. They were looking for a roboticist and that was just down the road from the university. So you know, all the stars aligned and uh, I joined uh, that organization. I stayed there for 25 years did lots of really interesting robotics applications and then moved to university in 2010. So did robotics somehow happen to you or was there, was there a spark behind it or just having that first uh, feel of robotics got you into it? I think it was that first, that first feel uh, of, of robotics, I think was uh, pretty tantalizing. In electrical engineering, I specialized in control theory uh, so I start off as a control theorist and control theory is pretty dry, to be honest. And you know, what's nice about a robot, it's got theory in it. There's about dynamics and control and kinematics and perception and things move and, and, and they, they do something useful. So to me, robotics was a lot more appealing than control theory, which could be pretty dry and mostly about proofs. I'm still not good with proofs. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine it, it does make it very real. And I think that that does drive the excitement. And, and you're right, the yeah. theory is what's driving it behind it. Uh, excellent. Tell us a little bit about your proudest moments in robotics. What, it, what is it that you remember is something that you really care about? I think the, some of the robotics systems that we built that I'm most proud of, uh, some of them would have been when I was at CSRO, we had a a period of almost a decade when we were building big robotic systems for the mining industry. And so you take a, a, a big machine, a great big earth moving machine uh, and you know, automate it. Uh, you, you turn it into a, a simple, uh, simple robot. So it might weigh many thousands of tons, but you could consider it to be a three or four degree of freedom robot. And so we did some really early work, late 90s on underground driving for one class of, of mining machine. So this was a machine back then, drive at 20 kilometers an hour through an underground tunnel with you know, this much clearance you know, on, on each side of the vehicle. Uh, so that, that was very impressive, a great team of people and a great technical achievement. Uh, and that technology got patented and licensed, actually, still in use today. Uh, that's, that's pretty nice as a roboticist to actually have something that's out there doing something useful for people. For me, anyway, that's about as, as good as it gets. Uh, we did another set of trials with a massive earth-moving machine in an open, open cut mine or strip mine, as they're sometimes called. And over a period of two weeks, we moved 250,000 tons of dirt. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which, it's hard yeah, to imagine. I have no idea what that represents. So I imagine <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, big pile of, pile of dirt. But we were trying to show that the machine, you know, over a long period of time, its average performance could be, you know, at, at least as good as, as a human being. So that was uh, something I felt very proud about. When I moved to the university, the, the centre that I, I lead, the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision, we entered the Amazon Robotics Challenge. Uh, in 2016, uh, we came sixth, and in 2017, we won the comp. Uh, so that's a thing I'm very, very proud about. I wasn't much involved in it, 
uh, technically, uh, but it was just great to lead a centre that yeah, had such talented people in it uh, that could do that could do that. And the other thing that I'd add, uh, not strictly robotics, but it was running ICRA 2018, which is in Brisbane, in my hometown. And uh, organising that was an awful lot of work. But when the conference actually ran and just see all the people that you know and respect, they're there and they're having a good time and enjoying the format. Uh, yeah, that to me was very, very rewarding. Uh, I'm not sure I'd ever do it again. Watching it from afar, I really enjoyed the fact that all the videos were online as well. So I think it was really yeah. good to see the see what was happening over there, even if you weren't actually present that year. Yeah, it's a, certainly it's a long it's a long way to come. But we tried to we tried to make some changes to to the format, make some innovations, and some of those. I guess they were they were still standing until COVID hit us, and then we're going to need a whole bunch of different innovations to uh, innovations. to make our conferences successful. Yeah, okay. I know you're also proud of your educational efforts. So if you go through your website, petercork.com, you see you know on the front page, robot academy, robotics toolbox, machine vision toolbox. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, they are things that I am enormously proud of, uh, and. I guess what makes me, makes me really happy is that they're widely used. So, you know, you can spend a lot of time creating open source resource that other people would use. But when you actually got the hard statistics that show you that people are using it, you get people write lovely emails to me and say, you know, thank you for writing this toolbox. You know, that makes it, makes it all worthwhile. So toolbox is dated back to some scruffy code I wrote to help myself during my PhD. And uh, I had an, uh, an enlightened boss at, uh, at one point, and he said, you should just open source this, even though the organization I worked for didn't really understand what open source was. So it was a bit of a sort of uh, stealthy open sourcing, uh, legal, but stealthy. Uh, so, and it, it just got out there and people used it and it developed a whole sort of life of, it, of its own. And it got me thinking about how how you would teach robotics. At that point, I was in a government R&D organization, so I wasn't doing teaching. But having created a tool set that was used by people for teaching, it got me thinking about you know, how should we be teaching robotics? You know, what's the right things to teach? What are the things that we teach that maybe aren't that, actually that useful that we could leave out? So it got me thinking about teaching, and eventually that led to, led to the textbook, Robotic Vision and Control, which has been also enormously successful. And it's very different to most other textbooks. It's very chatty, it's quite conversational and it's not too maths heavy. And that probably reflects my own uh, weakness at maths, I will confess. Uh, so I struggle with maths. I've got better over time, but uh, I, I, I- As do I many of your readers, I'm sure. That probably makes it much <laughs> more accessible. So that's probably a good thing. It is, and I think increasingly, uh, I think the, the, the level of maths education, I think, has actually diminished over time. And I know a lot of people feel that, that it's quite socially acceptable to say, I'm not good at maths. I guess I just said that I'm not very good at maths, uh, but I understand the importance of maths. So if we can present the material in a way that doesn't require too much math, I think that's very helpful. Or if we can motivate people to understand why it is you need the maths in order to, to solve a robotic forward kinematic problem or an inverse kinematic problem or dynamics problem. If you know why you're trying to get somewhere, then perhaps you're going to you know, put in, invest the, the time and the effort to, to understand it. So, uh, so that book has been very successful. Uh, second edition in, came out in 2017 and there will be uh, a third edition I'm going to uh, start working on next year. And the third edition uh, will be different. The third edition uh, will use Python instead of MATLAB as a language throughout the book. And right now I'm involved in big coding project that's eating my life, uh, which is converting the existing toolboxes uh, in, in MATLAB. 25 years old, the, the robotics toolbox for MATLAB. Uh, and so yeah, it's all being redone in Python. 
and it makes it's a lot looking, of sense. It, yeah, my students are also um, working with Python a lot in robotics, and, and I think yeah. it does open it up. It does open it up to a bit of a crowd. It opens it up to a much bigger audience, so people around the world who perhaps can't afford uh, a, a MATLAB a MATLAB license, uh, you know, they can get they can get Python for free. So I think it increases the increases the size of the uh, size of the audience and the reach of of the tools. And that's, that's important to me. Uh, and so the other educational resource is the Robot Academy. And the Robot Academy builds on the book and the book builds on the toolboxes, uh, but it's a bunch of lessons, uh, each one relatively short. There's 200 of them. None of them are, any, are longer than eight minutes. And they take you through almost all aspects of robotics from why it is we need robotics, a bit about ethics, kinematics, transforms, quaternions, all those sorts of things. And they're done in the same sort of chatty and, and conversational way. And they've also been very successful. Analytics tell me that every minute somebody watches, uh, watches a video. So, you know, we've been in the 12 minutes that we've been talking, 12 people have watched a, a lesson on the Robot Academy. And I haven't had to do a thing. And that's the great thing about online education is you put in the effort up front to create it. And then you can teach while you sleep. And it's got to be yeah. as that's got to be as good as it gets, right? In in yeah, the teaching yeah. gig, you your auto reply suggests you're on holidays, but are you actually coding? Are you doing this conversion to Python right now? Uh, I had a coding holiday, <laughs> <laughs> so I took a week off work and stayed at home and coded. Uh, my wife is very tolerant; she shakes her head, uh, but she's very tolerant. So yeah, that's what I do. All right. Well, I mean, why why do it? Because it is a huge amount of effort to write the books, to produce the code that people use around the world. We recently tried to do this in my lab. I thought we'd make a code base for swarm robotics and just realized yeah. what a mountain it is and what effort and dedication it's, it takes. It's yeah. huge. It, it really is. And uh, I, what can I say? I don't have a hobby. Uh, this is my hobby. Uh, it's what I really like to do. So yeah, if it's something that you really like to do, you can uh, find the, the, the time and the energy to make it happen. But to actually knuckle down and do the book, I can't do that in the cracks of my day job. So uh, in, when I've ever done this in the past, I've basically taken a sabbatical, you know, gone somewhere uh, away from disconnect email and just work single-mindedly for, for six months to, to crank, out the, crank out a draft of the book. And that's, that's the only way I know how to do it. And I'll do the same thing, same thing next year. So tell us, about a, tell us about a time where the systems didn't work, where your mining robots didn't work or the Amazon <laughs> challenge failed. I mean, what, what happens when things go wrong? Things go wrong a lot. Uh, I think as roboticists, we know uh, things don't always go well. And we all know the, the problems with demos. So all the problems I, uh, I've ever had have been to do with, with, with demos. I guess that's because it's most public, right? Uh, you, know, you and your students can work away on something that doesn't work and you have a discussion, you fix it and, and you iterate. The most, the most embarrassing uh, robot uh, fail that I've been associated with was early 2000s and we were doing early work on, uh, on drones, on flying robots. And so we were trying to uh, boost the case for, for, for funding into flying robots and we got a bunch of dignitaries, uh, including uh, the state government of Queensland and the premier of the state of Queensland, we took them all to a big uh, stadium in Brisbane. Uh, it's called the Gabba. For those of you who, who know, know cricket will know the Gabba uh, cricket ground. And they were all there and we, we, we were going to bring the drone in. It was going to do some manoeuvres and come down. And yeah, yeah, it crashed. Uh, <laughs> Did it crash of all badly or, or was it, <laughs> was it, it didn't still catch... okay? You know, a crash <laughs> is bad, but there's a bad crash and a good crash. So It didn't, it didn't catch fire. <laughs> uh, it was not that badly injured, but the premier of the state, uh, he was very worried about the drones. He ran out onto the, onto the, onto the ground and uh, oh. you know, tried to see that everything was all good. So people were quite, actually were quite, it was quite touching how concerned people were for, were for the drone. Uh, that mm -hmm. was, that was surprising, but yeah, that was a very, very, very public fail. Uh, we've got better at drones since then, but uh, 
Yeah. yeah do you have, that do you one have sticks a, a in message my mind. from that? Did it impact you in the long term? <laughs> do you have a message like it's going to be okay even if you fail in a very massive way? It, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, thing, things things pan out uh, in in the end. Uh, people are actually probably pretty understanding of, but of of what they understand to be cutting edge tech, and it's not always going to be not always going to be perfect. And yeah, you should practice a lot. But then, you know, we did practice a lot and there was still uh, so actually mechanical failure on the on the machine that caused it to to tank. So yeah, you can do all the prep work. Uh, ultimately, you're just there crossing your fingers and hoping that's going to work. Uh, I don't know a better way. Yeah. We, we once lost one drone and it just flew away and we never found it. So we were ringing on everyone's door to see if they had it on their rooftop and Never, never came back, um, but nothing bad ha happened, or at least we never heard about it. So that was good. Um, <laughs> great. Is there, what does, what does a day in your life look like? Uh, and you can, you can choose pre COVID, post COVID coding holidays, any day you'd like. <laughs> look for me, a good day actually involves me writing some code. Uh, so often that's you know, early in the morning or, or it's late at night. Uh, once the, the day job proper starts, no, there's not much opportunity for that. I'm currently director of two robotic centers. So yeah, my life has got a lot of meetings in it. Uh, these days, a lot of them are Zoom meetings, but whatever, there, there are a lot of meetings. The best meetings are the meetings with students. So meeting with my research students or meeting with undergraduate students. Uh, we have undergraduate students do projects in the lab. So meeting with them, I think they're the, the, highlight, the highlight meetings. Uh, and I have a light teaching load. So in the first semester of the year, I teach an undergraduate uh, robotics class. So talk about mobile robots and SLAM is, is what I teach. And I love teaching. I love the face-to-face -face teaching in the classroom. Uh, but I also really enjoy what it is we can do using you know, online technologies to teach at scale. Uh, because, you know, in, in my life, if I at the university, I can teach 80, 80 students a year. Yeah, that's not many given, I think, the huge number of roboticists that we're going to have to train. So these other resources, toolboxes, books, and online robot academy, you know, give me reach of hundreds of thousands of students. And, you know, I think that's, that's going to be important when we, you know, try to build a workforce for, for robotics, which is going to be, you know, one of the hugest indus industries of, of this century. So whether it's whether it's your PhD students or your undergrads or your online students, what, what would you tell them about a career in robotics? Or what would you tell your younger self about what this career might look like? For my younger self, I'd have to tell, I'd have to say, hey, there is this thing called robotics and it's oh. going to be really cool and it's going to be really big. Uh, for, for students today, um, yeah, I'd probably tell them uh, pretty much the same message that it, it is uh, it is going to be a very huge field. There are some still some significant challenges. Robots still aren't as ubiquitous as we would like them to be. You know, even in my own lab, uh, it's it's a pleasant surprise when I see a robot uh, wandering you know past my office door. You know, it's not an everyday occurrence. And in a robotics lab, I keep asking myself the question: Why is it not routine that there are robots everywhere why don't we have robots greeting visitors at the door and showing them around the lab we have the ability um, te technically we have the ability to do that but there's something about the, the way we we execute the, the the systems engineering behind robotics is still too hard and i don't quite understand why that why that is even us as roboticists still find it very hard to build robots that that do amazing things. So huge upside, huge potential in the field. And you know, that's what I would tell, 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 tell students. I do tell students. Huge potential, but not yet quite there then. What do you think is the next frontier in robotics or your next frontier? My own personal next frontier, I think, is going to be much more on the on the education on the education front. So there are things that I want to do. I've you know alluded to some of those. They're going to be a lot of they're going to be a lot of work, and I want to see them done see them done properly. Uh, there, in in robotics at the moment, I guess there's a huge interest in in deep learning, uh, and that's, you know, has impacted on the perception side a lot over the last almost decade, you know, the ability to understand imagery is, is 
massively improved than what it was 10 years ago. So that's been a big impact. I think we're now starting to see um, machine learning techniques, particularly reinforcement learning, uh, now start to impact on the control side. So it's, now it's a much more targeted at the, at the heart of robotics, which is about how do you control the machine to do a thing? Uh, so that's going to sweep through, through robotics starting now, but it's going to get bigger and bigger. The other area of robotics that I think has probably not got the attention that it deserves is around physical interaction between robots and, and the environment. So, you know, when we tackle grasping problems, we think about it mostly as about how do we use perception to guide the robot's fingers to the vicinity of the, of the thing, and then we just squeeze our fingers and we, pick, and we pick it up. But if we want to do more complex manipulation tasks, you know, perhaps, you know, using tools, grinding, polishing is an area of interest of mine at the moment then we've kind of got to go back to the 80s when people were looking at uh, force control techniques. Uh, we've got the theory for all of that, but we still don't have the robots to do that. Some of the more modern robots we have can do quite a good job of force control. We've got a, uh, a number of Frank Emika pandas in the lab now. Beautiful robot for doing force control, but we've got to get, the, get some applications built that show these robots doing really important, useful, tasks with force control. So, so really progressing both the vision side and progressing the ability to interact with the physical world and tying those yeah. to bring some of these robotic Absolutely. systems to the real world. Yeah, and they're hoary old robotics problems, right? There's papers on they these are, things yeah, going, yeah. going back to the 80s. But uh, I think for the moment, there's been a bit of a gosh into deep learning. So everyone's piled into deep learning while there are other you know, quite important problems in robotics that uh, that need to be looked at by smart people. Fair enough. Well, thanks so much, Peter, for joining us today on the show. Thanks, Sabine. Great, great to chat. Thank you.